a lot of professional mathematicians, possibly including me, are not good writers. And so maybe maybe it's it's just good to get feedback. And there's really very little feedback, in fact, in, in our community, I feel. I wanted to ask you about it. Can you please comment on the feedback in our community? Because I agree with your point of view. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, I, I personally think the state of the art, is, state of affairs is terrible. Like for talks, it's even worse. Okay, so you, you don't like that sort of trying to figure something out, thinking through ideas and, oh, you don't? We have this kind of seminars where you're not allowed to be prepared. <laughs> what? <laughs> How does that work? Welcome to MATLAB Balance. Today, our guest is Thomas Nikolaus, professor in the University of Münster, working in homotopy theory and K-theory. Welcome, Thomas. It's a pleasure to ask you about your experience in mathematics. Yeah, hi, Mora. Thanks for having me. And thanks for uh, hosting this channel and doing this interview. Oh, you're very welcome. So let's start. Uh, I have seen from your CV that your uh, path to your current areas of research was not straightforward. You've started with mathematical physics. I when you start in a new field, how, how do you feel? I mean, you don't know people, you don't know what's going on. How, how is it? I mean, for me, I guess, I mean, it, it's really it's really a common theme in math. I think the moment you, you start learning something new, I guess you, you start with zero, right? You're basically like a student or like a beginner, like that's a, that's a very common thing in math. I think that's actually the reason why a lot of mathematicians don't do that too often. Like the moment you, you are somehow in one area and you master, you feel like you're like at the top of research in one area, it's, it's hard to leave that because somehow the moment you, you start doing something else, you, you, you have to basically start at zero. You have to feel like a student. And that's a feeling which, which isn't always great, of course, like it, it comes with like, I mean, basically demands hard work and, and demands sacrificing and suffering through it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, in my case, it wasn't so bad. Actually, I, I was really pretty lucky when I, I got, I'm, I'm, I made a move to Regensburg and I ran into David Gepner and sort of basically, I didn't know so much homotopy theory and David like just taught me basically everything I know about it, but like from, from his point of view. So I learned from the beginning to think of it the way maybe, maybe people, a lot of people learn it these days, like this kind of uh, categorical homotopy theoretic perspective and somehow was a lot of fun, in fact. And I, you know, you're right, somehow at the beginning, I didn't know many people, but I mean, for me, it wasn't a problem. It actually, it felt a little bit like, didn't have much pressure since I didn't know anyone, no one thought I had to deliver. I just had time to learn that stuff. It, it gave me a couple of years actually to just, do my thing and learn stuff and yeah that was, felt pretty good this leads to several questions i wanted to ask um so one of them is uh how do you find the balance between learning new things and doing new, new math improving results so it's like learning versus actively working yeah good good question i, I mean i'm not sure i actually think somehow I'm probably leaning a little bit towards too much learning new stuff and maybe not not enough like writing up stuff recently just because I somehow I mean I guess the moment you figure something out very often it's kind of I mean get writing something down is I mean as probably everyone knows pretty pretty tedious and annoying sometimes so somehow you feel like you understand something it's kind of a little bit losing its kind of excitement and you might sort of turn towards something new figuring something new out and learning something new and I actually don't distinguish personally between learning something and figuring something out. Somehow. Pretty much always learning something is, is a little bit like figuring a lot of stuff out yourself. You have to find yourself your own way through somehow. Even old theories, you do all the little exercises, you do the little computations. It's kind of pretty much the same in some sense to, to figuring something out. I mean, of course, the, the big difference is the moment you're like sort of figuring something out, which is not known, you have to somehow embrace the fact that no one can help you. Whereas if you're like sort of learning something, which a lot of people know, you can easily get help and sort of get the philosophy and the right perspective from people. But I mean, returning to your question, I think um, I, 
I basically really enjoy learning new maths, like no matter what. And so I have to force myself, in fact, very often to write up stuff that I have already figured out. So in that sense, I'm maybe not not optimal on this, like sort of on on finding the balance. So maybe the correct answer is I don't. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me to start the day writing stuff and then somehow maybe mm. maybe normal days I, I start writing up stuff in the morning and then once somehow I have lunch and then I just do the fun part, figuring stuff out, talking to colleagues, reading stuff. But you of course. I forgot about teaching and all the tons of other duties you have. <laughs> yeah, teaching is part of the fun. <laughs> no, I really like teaching, actually. I think it's, it's a great part of the job. Do you have any uh, life hacks or advice about teaching? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's the obvious kind of calls. One should be going to transport being enthusiastic about the subject, because I think there's rarely anything like more boring than if, if the speaker himself is bored about what he's talking about. So of course you, you have to somehow convey your enthusiasm and maybe somehow, I mean, of course you, you have to be upfront, but I mean, these are obvious calls, but you have to be upfront about making mistakes and sort of, of course, not shy away from, from showing that you, you, you made a mistake or you, you don't understand something possibly. I mean, this happens all the time to me that I sort of, prepare something and in the morning before the lecture I figure out I, I just don't understand a certain proof and then of course at this point you just have to be honest some people try to sort of rush through it and hope no one figures it out and of course that's that's bad style but I think these are obvious calls in some sense that's not obvious <laughs> um okay so uh you mentioned that uh you like uh learning new stuff and uh, changing areas. So I remember when I was applying for postdocs, you gave me a good advice. Uh, you told me it's important to branch out. So uh, can you comment more on that? Right. I think it's 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 very it's a very common trajectory of like biography in, in, in math or like maybe in general in fundamental science that people just sort of basically do their PhD and maybe if you're like at one of the top schools like you have an advisor who's like world leading expert in that area and you somehow write a pretty good thesis you get a good topic and you, you, you yourself become actually very deep in that subject but then somehow I think at some point in your career you have to somehow ask yourself I mean you're really, I mean, do I, is it better to st stay in that area for my entire life and maybe write really good papers or, or is it better to learn something new and branch out? And I, I'm personally sure that it's better to branch out. You, you learn new maths. This will actually infuse like new ideas into your thinking. This will sort of teach you new techniques. I mean, you'll get to know a different community. And I mean, if if only to realize that your initial topic was the thing you loved most, right? I mean, how, how would you know, like, without ever checking something else? <laughs> I wanted to ask, when you, you have your own PhD students, right? And um, do you give them, like, one project to work on, or you give different problems, or you don't give any problems? How does it work? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. I think it's such a hard thing, actually. <laughs> And I, I mean, I currently have three PhD students and I'm, of course, at the very beginning of that game. So I, I, I'm, I'm still learning. I, dis, I, I discuss it with them at the moment and sort of what I, what I did is I was sort of giving them something to, to figure out to begin with, actually. And so that they could relatively early, like work something out, right? Sort of maybe in, in the optimal case, write a paper. And like, I, I don't have a master plan about that at the moment. I think it's also people are too individual, but somehow my, my rough idea is to somehow initially, I mean, but this is, as I said, just what I do at the moment. I don't know if, <laughs> if I ever watch this video again in a couple of years, if I'd, I'd be like, man, how <laughs> advice. But of course, then I think somehow something get Figuring something out pretty early on is, is a good idea. Something little, something maybe you could write a paper or if it's just going to be a section or a chapter in your final PhD synthesis, so that you have something written up. You can also use that in order to teach people how to write up math. Because that's what I think is practically the hardest thing in math. Like not, not just coming up only with an idea and proving something, but then writing it up. And you know, I mean, everyone knows this, like certainly you have a correct proof of something, you've explained it to colleagues on the board, but the moment you start typing things and getting the references, like 
it's an endless process. You find so many little gaps and little things. So somehow really, I, I, I believe like only the moment you have managed to write it down in coherent documents somehow. And that, that's one of the things I want to teach them early on. You mentioned that you would teach them how to write. And I'm curious about it because uh, I was never taught how to write. And <laughs> no, I, I mean, I actually have to say I was pretty lucky in that respect. I had a great advisor, Christoph Schweigert in Hamburg. And when I, I mean, this was actually, I think, uh, at the beginning of my PhD, I was supposed to write something up and like somehow, I was like convinced I'm, I'm a great writer, you know, and I've written up stuff during the, <laughs> during my studies, I've always like tagged notes and so on. I thought like, yeah, no problem. And then, then I typed it up and I mean, of course it was terrible, but I, I wasn't aware <laughs> I went into him and sort of, he, I gave it to him and he was like, I mean, gave it back to me the whole like the whole sheet was red and like he was like this is terrible <laughs> i was pretty disappointed for a day and then i sort of brought up a second version i improved some of the points and he again gave it back to me like being completely red and that continued like four or five times until when i sort of had some sort of basic principles realized so you know i mean when you're a student you're pretty i mean like at least in my case i thought you know writing mass is like a textbook basically like a textbook without any explanation just lemma definition theorem proof yeah. and stuff like that and that's i mean of course unreadable I mean, we're not reading for we're not writing for machines a lot of professional mathematicians possibly including me are not good writers and so maybe maybe it's it's just good to get feedback and there's really very little feedback, in fact, in, in our community, I feel. I wanted to ask you about it. Can you please comment on the feedback in our community? Because I agree with your point of view. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, I, I personally think the state of the art, is, state of affairs is terrible. Like, you never, I mean, one never, almost never gets, like, helpful, honest feedback. Like, somehow, most of the time, I mean, I guess, I mean, how, how, when did you ever get a sort of, like real response when you uploaded a paper like you get a referee report most of the time and maybe maybe some emails like yeah i read your paper it's nice but you know what i mean it's great to hear of course like you know thomas maybe you get such emails i get emails oh i saw your paper it's nice but I, read. <laughs> <laughs> I read i don't get <laughs> no and i have to say i'm also like guilty of very often not writing these emails because i mean i you read a paper and you think somehow this is a great paper but here the the writer could improve but then i mean it's also a little hard to write that email I've, i found myself a couple of times in that situation and you're like sort of i don't know the author or i don't know him well and sort of you and then i mean you end up writing that you read the paper and this and this is great and maybe here's a little mistake but you, you don't say that Somehow, I mean, I usually don't say that somehow, unless I know someone really well that this passage could be improved the writing and so on. But I think there are people who do that, and I really appreciate that. Really? Do they yeah. exist? I mean, for example, I think Lars Hesselholt, like, is great. He always gives advice along these lines. He's pretty awesome, actually, in that respect. Sort of. And yeah, I, but I, and I mean, I think the state of, I mean, for talks, it's even worse. Like somehow, as you give a talk, like sort of in the in the best case, like everyone's nodding and people come to you after the talk and are like, ah, oh, nice talk. And in the worst case, you don't get any comment. No, no. In the worst case, you get, ah, oh, nice talk. I oh. mean, nice talk, people always say, regardless of how you've given a talk. <laughs> I mean, I have to say, and I, I know I'm probably unique in that respect, but I really like talks most when people stand up and like sort of pose to what you say and say, no, I, I think differently and this is not the way you should do things and so on and so forth. I, I've had that a couple of times, like, and it, it's always been great fun and sort of, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I agree that, uh, I mean, there's almost no feedback in our community and I, I don't really have a good idea how to improve that situation. Of course, I try to give feedback to people I know well and my students and I, I really always ask people for feedback. But it's really hard to somehow improve the situation in general. Like especially, especially you know, you don't want to somehow if you if you don't know someone well, you don't want to sort of stand up and sort of criticize something which comes off really weird. So yeah, it's it's a it's a hard situation, and maybe we as a community could contemplate. Doing, I mean, especially because of course in the end, at some point, people have to accept papers and give jobs, 
So behind the scenes, there's a lot of sort of judgment and so it would be more honest to give a little more direct uh, feedback in my opinion. I know back in my days in Bonn, we, we had a seminar which was really lively and it was actually hard for people from outside to sort of give a talk in that seminar and from out, it's probably still the case. And this is because, I mean, it was known that there was a lot of like asking, like people would really get into the gory details and ask people. And I mean, you would, I mean, if you, if you prove something which people thought was already proven, you would have got a comment about that. And I always thought this was partly really rude. And I understand that people got a little bit afraid of that. But on the other hand, I thought this was like actually more honest, like in a sense, you know, you, you got always, you got the chance to comment on that. And I mean, you know, for me, it was the same. I also like, I mean, had that experience in the past that I sort of figured something out, gave a talk about it, and someone told me this has already been like done in the 80s, like somehow. And I mean, of course, like you're not happy about that the moment it happens, but I mean, in the long run, it's actually much better. People are a little more upfront, in my opinion. But of course, having said this, I mean, this should not go to the point where, where especially young people get somehow really afraid of like, giving talks or get like some home in, in the fire in a hostile environment. So mm -hmm. I, that is why I say, I don't know. I, I've been thinking a lot about how to create an, I mean, as you know, you've, you've spoken in my seminar. I've been thinking a lot about how to create an atmosphere where there's an open discussion and some more questions and discussions and comments. And I mean, even comments of the sort, you know, why are you doing that? What's the point? And this is, or I mean, this is kind of a question which which is really rude in the sense if you ask that in a big conference, like, what's what? Why do you do that? What's the hell? But of course, it's it's a it's a it's a very important question in the sense, and and most people maybe especially young people struggle to give a like really shaped answer to that. But somehow maybe still still I think these questions that there must be a place where one can ask that without insulting people and just having an open discussion. So um, still, um, I'd like to ask about this lack of feedback thing. Uh, it brings, I think it's, I would say it's one of the main reasons to why uh, many people in their PhD, especially feel that they may be not good enough to continue in academia. So um, what would you tell to a student who tells you they are like unsure whether they can do it or not? And, Right. Well, that's that's a tricky one. Um, of course, I again, I I wouldn't. I mean, of course, I, I it would pretty much depend on the specific person, what you'd say. And somehow, I think, I mean, the reason a lot of people are unsure about whether they can make it or not is, I think, partly connected to not getting enough feedback, but also like there's so many. I mean, there's a variety of other reasons. So, I guess starting from the personality of people to somehow the pressure, the hostility they feel, the, you know, they, they, a lot of people feel dwarfed by listening to other people, which are apparently smarter. And like, of course, some people act as if they were super smart and sort of <laughs> partly because they are maybe unsure <laughs> or, you know, so I, I think there's tons of reasons. I mean, for, for one, I would tell people that this is, I mean, there are tons of reasons why somehow, I mean, everyone, basically, I mean, almost everyone in the mass community feels like not smart enough, <laughs> which I think is, is very kind of, it's, it's a bit paradox, right? <laughs> like a, a huge paradox that no one feels smart enough. And that, I mean, so I, I mean, I would tell them that everyone has that feeling and somehow I think, I mean, I would actually ask if they enjoy mass. Mm -hmm. not not and not mass in general you know like everyone says yes i enjoy mass but like not not just somehow big picture mass is so great thing but the the pro actual process of doing mass like sitting down for hours and hours and learning new theory and figuring out something and you keep doing something for two weeks and then you realize you were totally stupid this kind of process, you know, this is kind of what every, what mass is about, and somehow it really matters if you if you like that or not, and if you if you do like that, and I mean not not every always, right? I mean somehow, but most of the time you you're enthusiastic about that, you somehow have passion about that. If that is the case, then I mean you can give it a shot, you can give it a, should give it a try. So 
I, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not entirely sure about how this is like in all part of the world, but definitely in, in, in Europe, or at least in Germany, I mean, the cool thing is like, if you have an education in math, say a PhD, you'll always find a job, you'll always find a good, well paid job, which is a lot of fun outside of academia. Basically, even if you if you had a postdoc or two, and it didn't work out. So basically, the risk is very low. In some sense, I mean, I know people feel different about that, you know, most most of us being like so passionate about our job and sort of what we do it's like you, you feel like the moment I, I can't advance in academia I, I lose everything my work my life is not worth any, anything anymore but this is just not true that's the thing somehow it, it's a big relief to realize that you can always sort of do something else and actually other stuff is also so much fun like there's so many cool jobs and so I think somehow if you really enjoy Mars and you want to give it a shot and you, you feel enthusiastic about it, then I think usually most of the time it's worth giving it a shot. But on the other hand, actually, one should actually be careful in giving advice. That, that being said, so I, I don't really think somehow I should comment on someone else's like life decisions. So it's such, a, such an important decision. So everyone should make that decision, but I wouldn't necessarily sort of say it's not worth it because you feel not smart enough because that's what everyone has. I'm hesitating whether ask, to ask you or not uh, about this thing that you said that you should only do math if you enjoy two weeks of struggling with something and then failing to prove it. <laughs> because I think most people find it painful. And I mean, what, what's the definition of painful? Do you find it painful to actually sit there and try to prove it? Or do you find it painful to figure out that it was wrong? No, to sit and try to prove it. I find it ah, okay. So you, you don't like that? Sort of trying to figure something out, thinking through ideas and, oh, you don't? Why not? <laughs> Forget about it. Like, well, uh, maybe I should not be talking about it in your interview, but uh, myself, I've been thinking a lot about uh, yeah, my struggles with identifying myself as a mathematician because I think there are very different reasons that bring people into mathematics. One reason may be the one you described that like kids like to you know like play with this Rubik's cube and try to solve a problem, and then okay, they may become a mathematician and solve you know bigger mathematical problems. But this comes from that thing and. Well, but there also exist kids who just enjoy, you know, the beauty and they enjoy, you know, beautiful nature and and the beauty of mathematics and they just love when uh, when something beautiful is shown to them uh, or they can read it or see. So, you know, perceive beauty and share the beauty of mathematics uh, and not necessarily the struggle of trying to um, figure something out. Maybe maybe in your case, I, I could imagine, I, I, I'm not sure, I don't want to sort of put words in your mouth, but maybe you, I mean, there must be a lot of things you enjoy about it. About, I mean, is it only somehow learning something or understanding the elegance or is it also like? I think uh, being in mathematics consists of lots of activities. There's like, for example, what I enjoy is perceiving mathematics, sharing mathematics, mm -hmm. telling people about mathematics. I understand connecting people when they ask questions and uh, structuring the information I'm getting and many more things and uh, not necessarily just this uh, one thing which is considered to be the main thing where you sit down and you know try to s solve something for hours and then you know often fail uh, <laughs> but there is this image of a mathematician which is someone who is supposedly sitting in the cave you know uh, being starving and trying to solve this problem and uh, it's very hard to uh, get away from that image and realize the diversity of uh, people in mathematics and the things they enjoy. No, but I mean, like, so, so what you're saying basically is just you find work modes, you maybe talk to people, you somehow explain to people, you ask people, that's, a, that's just a slightly different work mode, but that seems to be the thing you enjoy, right? And so that's great. I mean, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about that old schoolish approach where you don't like you have to figure everything out yourself. I mean, of course, this is like not. I mean, we're 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 basically like in, in 
into the 21st century. This is not like how, how we work most of the time, right? Like we, we connect to people, we chat with people. And so I, and I mean, it sounds to me as if you enjoy that a lot, like talking to people, sort of being part of that community, which is great. Like, um, yeah. I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily thinking about that caveman style. <laughs> <laughs> mathematics like I, I'm not doing that, like, so. <laughs> I see right. so in, on the other hand of course yeah. I mean there are things you have to do by yourself I guess in math maybe more than in, in some other jobs like I guess w we started this discussion about learning new things I think at some point you have to basically sit down and learn something as well. maybe at least I mean at, maybe you don't have to sit down you have to chat with people and you have to run your ideas by them and get feedback and sort of get assigned little exercises. There's, there's a bunch of ways, but you, you have to learn something at some point. And it's, it's not always fun, obviously, like it's kind of <laughs> hard work and you have to, I mean, endure it through it a little bit. And I mean, only to eventually figure out it wasn't that hard. <laughs> and it's a little bit like, you know, I mean, it's a little bit like you're, you're you come there and you want to learn this topic and it's like a huge huge mountain in front of you it's like and you 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 think i mean there's this huge cliff and it looks really like sort of scaring and you have to climb it and you you power through it it's pretty hard you climb it up and eventually as you're on the top you just realize there's a staircase you know everyone else seems to be walking up it's kind of the feeling you have and somehow <laughs> the moment you, re you understand stuff you you not only think it's trivial, but also like everyone else somehow seems to like pretty effortless, like understand it. So that's kind of, but you, you can't somehow get like depressed by that feeling. You have to somehow accept that. And I don't know, I guess maybe, maybe you don't have to enjoy it. I mean, but you, I mean, this is in, in my opinion, or at least in my, in my way of doing that as part of the job, which is not necessarily true for everyone. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and another comment on your, uh, not necessarily research, but the, I guess, manner of presentation and also research. Um, I remember I was super excited with your K-theory mini course in Newton Institute because um, I struggled for many years with various definitions of K-theory, which never let me understood why do people bother to study this object. and your course made me realize that those were constructions and you gave a definition. And then later Lars said about your work that it's your thing to you know, give definitions instead of constructions. So how do you find the courage to you know, give non definitions that people usually don't use or invent your new own definitions? Uh, oh, thanks. I mean, this is really nice of you. Um, that was a fun summer in Cambridge um, yeah I guess um, yeah that's a that's a good question but I mean it's just basically I, I have the feeling I don't understand things before I don't phrase it that way I can I mean I, I agree with your I mean the same for me when I learned K theory I went through I mean I, let me not give names but I went through the standard literature and you feel like the plus construction and you attach cells and then you're asking why I mean what why why does one do that and most of the time in math I mean sometimes in math maybe you can't explain that there's some construction you just do because it works but most of the times I feel you can somehow give a deeper meaning of that. And in the case of K theory, it's, it's in my opinion, pretty obvious. Like you, you define K naught as a group completion. So you should somehow define the higher K, K theory also as a group completion and sort of just feels most natural. And I mean, as it turns out, I, I'm actually, if you, if you read Quillen's old like papers, he, he has realized that completely. Of course, Siegel, I mean, Siegel maybe was the first to give that definition in the sense in terms of its Siegel spaces and he actually refers back to Quillen so I think Quillen has understood all of that and of course back in the day like the sort of technology wasn't there to more, not only give that definition but work with it but I always think somehow one has should have the right definition and then maybe maybe even if somehow this means it becomes more technical eventually to work with it I would always strive to give the correct definition because this is like what somehow is most important. This is the object. It's defined like that. It has this property, and that pins it down. And then maybe eventually you have to invest more into the technique to work with it, right? That's basically what somehow 
what is done these days in homotopy theory and higher category theories. Uh, so let me ask you about a different subject. Uh, I know that you care a lot about your research group. Uh, what do you do uh, for, for your research group? Which, I mean, except for just formally being you know, head of a group. Well, I mean, I guess I, I really, I mean, I generally just care about the com mass community, like, and sort of, I guess in this incarnation, it's my little group, but somehow I think, I mean, I, I just try to somehow create an atmosphere where we chat and meet, and I would basically host a lot of barbecue parties at my place, <laughs> <laughs> not, not in Corona times, <laughs> but of course beforehand and after that, and somehow just, we would just hang out and, I mean, I mean, I guess I, I just love sort of having a beer and having a barbecue, having, you know, whatever, some salad and chatting about some, some math. And it's not, a, I mean, I, I want to mention that, I mean, it's important to make sure we're not sort of pressuring people into sort of doing job, I mean, work in their free time. It's more about somehow, I think, sort of putting, putting, work and mass into a somewhat casual atmosphere i think helps a lot in my case and or my group and so we we meet a lot we chat about stuff and yeah i try to teach people how to give talks we have this kind of seminars where you're not allowed to be prepared <laughs> what <laughs> how does that work oh this is like a seminar where you're not allowed to prepare your talk and of course i mean you know everyone knows everyone is preparing of course I, i'm totally aware <laughs> The purpose of this is different. I mean, the purpose is that I think somehow in our seminars, the greatest discussions always come come if you go into some tangent. If someone asks a question, how does this relate to this and that? And then somehow we, we start all discussing, discussing about it. Someone goes up to the board. That's kind of the thing. And so usually these discussions don't happen in any talk or so. And the reason is because the speaker usually wants to go through some material. And so I'm always telling people just loosely prepare a little bit of material and then we just see how it goes. And so maybe maybe the discussion goes into a tangent and you continue next week or not. I mean, these are just our internal seminars and that's how they go. And I think this is great fun. <laughs> I actually was a little bit inspired by, by Dennis Sullivan's seminar at CUNY in New York once gave a talk there and someone people told me in advance that I mean there's no point in preparing anyways so <laughs> maybe you shouldn't <laughs> and, <laughs> and you didn't. Very awesome like uh, people I mean people warned me they were like ah oh, this is so scary and Dennis is but I, I thought it was great fun like he just I mean Dennis was there and some other people and we just had a long discussion and I was saying one sentence like I mean x is a spectrum and then someone was like wow what is the spectrum I don't know and uh, doesn't even make sense and then, like we chatted about like how one can think about connective spectra and what's the difference between the space and its suspension spectrum is and sort of uh, well I thought it was awesome we just had so many things and like I mean you know it sounded like a little bit ignorant I mean I'm, you know the point is like everyone know, knew what a spectrum is in the room of course like it wasn't like that people didn't know it was just about sort of rethinking things and sort of getting people's opinions on some aspects and so on I thought this was pretty awesome. It ended up being like a six hour talk or something oh, wow. between. And then we kept going like until the evening, until everyone was tired. And then Dennis invited me over to, to actually the Science Institute. The next day we kept discussing. It was awesome, really. I, I was really impressed. I mean, how like he, he would start thinking about these things and had different ideas and everyone was contributing. So speaking of that, many students and PhD students are, I think, afraid to ask questions at seminars because they believe they would be considered not smart enough. What is your opinion on that? Do you ever judge someone for asking too many questions? No, I mean, and the opposite. I, I think I always think, every, basically, every, I mean, every question is, is great. Like, I mean, of course, I mean, this is not literally speaking true, but I mean, it's, it's close enough to the reality to welcome every question. So I think, um, yeah, I, I always think people should ask questions. And I mean, what's the point also, like what's the point about sitting in a seminar where you can't follow the math? Like, why would you do that? Of course, I mean, I'm not saying that this never happens to me, like this happens to everyone. But most of the time, like, I mean, I also find it like totally okay to just ask a question to, to like 
sort of slow the speaker a little bit down. That's what I do sometimes, right? You, you somehow feel the speaker is writing down some definition and really quick and you know, I somehow know this and like, if I don't ask right now, I probably think about it for the next five minutes and then I realize I didn't understand something and then the talk is like gone. Can't ask this question anymore and like you can't follow the talk anymore, like it's over. Like you can only ask at this point this question and like almost certainly it's gonna be somewhat stupid. <laughs> But so what? I mean, then then maybe the speaker tells you why it was stupid and doesn't make sense, and you have like time to sort of come back, find your composure, and like sort of follow the rest of the talk. And of course, probably people think it's it's kind of stupid and slowing the speaker down, but it helps me and maybe helps some other people to somehow follow the talk. So I yeah, my answer is that I don't think of badly of anyone doing that, and the opposite. That's good. I'm glad we have recorded this. <laughs> 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 come after me with it later <laughs> no 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 when i hear next time from students that they don't want to ask questions because i'll show them it's actually a very important thing i think and one should really not be afraid of asking questions especially because i think like i mean it, it's even stupid as a speaker think about you're the speaker in the seminar i mean what would you want that no one asks a question and no one follows and no one cares of course no not. it's it's sad <laughs> Like it's that would it's a waste of time for everyone. I think I mean like it's it's I mean if you think about it, it's amazing that we sit there for one hour and listen to someone. Like when in life does this ever happen that someone speaks for like one hour like straight and everyone else listens? Like um since you have now quite a big research group, I wonder uh what do you look at when you know hiring people in your group or going through many applications? What is important for you? I mean, of course, I mean, first thing I, I can't really, I mean, we have this huge cluster in Münster and we des decide together. So I can't really decide alone, but I usually actually like to really read the research statements people give, like them all. Um, I, I'm not such a huge fan of the letter writing system because I mean basically all the letters are enthusiastic and then the moment you start reading letters you start interpreting single words and I, I don't like that because I also know if I write letters like I'm not necessarily like sort of reliable enough in, in my choice of words that it can be interpreted to this extent later on. Yeah it's, it's a hard process and I'm aware that somehow every hiring is I mean, unfair to the people you don't hire. And I mean, yeah, I, I really apologize for everyone I don't hire because there's so many people who really deserve a job and sort of, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's one of my, I mean, in, in some sense it's great because I, you get to know young people and you get to hire young people and you have awesome people in your group. I mean, it's so awesome to see like these people like coming out of PhDs and having great ideas and doing awesome mathematics and sort of, developing further things i mean i have started and other people have started and but on the other hand it's also terrible like you have to make a decision and you know you know it's it's going to be unfair no matter what but i yeah I, I i try my best to to get as good as a fair decision as i can which is basically an impossible task <laughs> unfortunately uh, I guess even to you, you had the moments of frustration in mathematics. How do you get over them? Yeah, I, I mean, one thing which which is in my, I mean, this is more of a practical thing I do, but I usually have several things going on at the same time, like several projects and several things I think about. I mean, it's not like, I mean, 10 or so, but like two or three and somehow what happens very often is that you get stuck with one thing you, you can't like figure something out and maybe you realize you either need a new idea or a fresh mind or i don't know you want to you want to let it sit for two weeks three weeks or so and then i usually just like sort of turn to another project and sort of the good thing is if these projects are in different stages one project is maybe like close to finish you're like writing but even writing i mean writing in the sense that you're like figuring out these little details which also like, I mean, this can take forever as everyone knows, but somehow, and maybe you have the other project, which is at the beginning, you just think about it. Okay, let me ask you the last question. Oh. Um, which 
you have already answered, but I really like your advice in general. So can I ask you again, uh, which one advice would you give to young mathematicians? Mm, don't be afraid. Okay. Somehow, this is an overall advice. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to learn new stuff. Don't be afraid to try new techniques. Not be afraid of sort of doing this kind of little little daydream style mathematics of things and sort of ignoring all sort of problems you're aware of. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much.